we see a, a man rise up who's not a judge. He's not even a leader that God has called. He is
light shining on you cannot be brighter than the light shining in you. So, I want to try to help you. Right. How, how do I avoid, uh, how do I know that I avoid obscurity? All right. So if you're asking yourself, have I embraced obscurity? I want to ask you some questions. How, how do I know that I avoid obscurity. Let me, let me tell you a few ways. All right. The first way that you know that you avoid obscurity is that you would say, I am in a rush to get to greatness. I'm in a rush to get to greatness. You'll know you're in a rush to get to greatness when serving feels like a waste of time. And I'm preaching today. I don't, I don't know if y'all know. It's my last Sunday in my 30s. I'm coming for you next. You'll know that you're in a rush to get to greatness if when you serve, you're like, why am I doing this? You feel like your gifts aren't being used and nothing that you're doing now is preparing you for your ultimate purpose. Um, I, I remember this in my 20s. Uh, in my 20s, we, we were just having kids. That was our thing. And no one would call me and offer me a full-time position uh, in ministry. And so I, in my 20s, I just thought I was missing the will of God for my life because I wasn't in full-time ministry and I was just raising babies. And I just wish someone would have came to me and said, bro, there's nothing more important right now than for you to love your wife, love your babies, go work hard at work because you need to provide for those things, right? Like, I, I wanted that, but I spent my 20s just, like, wishing that I get a phone call. And, and the problem is that many of us want in our 20s what other people have bled for in the 40s. Okay. I'm talking to you. I, uh, I told you guys I got saved at age 19. And right when I... I uh, got saved. I, I, walked, I walked into the bathroom at the camp that I was at, and my pastor was using the John right there, and I was so excited that I walked up to him while he was in mid-process and was like, and was like hey, pastor, I, I'm called to preach. I, I just gave my life to Jesus, and I'm called to preach. And he didn't, even, he didn't even look at me. He just, while he was going, just said, I sure hope so, because you're going to be preaching to the whole church at the end of this month. And I was like, <laughs> and sure enough, I did it. At the end of the month, I got up on the stage in front of the whole church, and it was awful. It was awful. Horrible. And so I get down from the stage, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, next time I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that. And my pastor comes up to me, and he says, hey, you're not going to be back up there. 
So that's not the place to work out all this stuff. He's like, but, but come here. You see Emma over there? Emma runs our convalescent home ministry. I want you to go see her and pick a Sunday every month to go preach at the convalescent home and don't stop until I tell you to. Years. Guys. Years. I didn't know what he was doing in the moment. But you know what he was doing? He was hiding me. He was putting me in obscurity. Because what I realized when I got to that convalescent home is that the same eight or nine or ten people would show up every week. And no matter what I did, if it was the best sermon, Amy, tell the truth, if it was the best sermon I've ever preached, I'm sweaty, I'm excited, nothing. Or if it was the worst, if I just came out ill-prepared, nothing. The same lady, every single time I finished, as soon as I said amen, she'd stand up and she'd say, thank you for coming. Every time. People would, they would fall asleep. And so I would make it like my goal to just keep people awake. Years. We went to the retirement home. And I'm so glad that we did it. Because that's where I got my reps. Right? That's where I was able to work out all this stuff. And I grew like crazy. I was preparing sermons, so I was always ready to share the Word of God. And as I would naturally start to backslide, I always knew that in a couple weeks or in a week or in a day, I'd have to be back there in front of people preaching the Word of God. So it always just kept me from backsliding as well. I am so glad I had a pastor who saw my giftedness as a threat just as much as he saw it as an opportunity. And so you know that you avoid obscurity if you're in a rush to greatness. Second, you would say, my busyness and grind is loud. My busyness and grind is loud. You don't know how to do hard things without being seen. Everyone has to know when you're working hard. We all know when you're at the gym. We all know when you're sitting down doing a devotion. We all know when you're serving the poor. Like, it, your, your, your faithfulness, you can't grind faithfully and quietly. I believe it was Jesus who said, don't let your left right hand see what your right hand's doing. Right? Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. So, you're going to rush to get to greatness. Your busyness and your grind is loud. The third thing you would say is, I want all the benefits of notoriety while neglecting the difficulty." I meant to hurt you today. I want all the benefits of notoriety without neglecting, while neglecting the difficulties. Uh, Charles Spurgeon uh, was once talking to younger Christians, and he said this. He said, don't go into the ministry to save your soul. Listen, this is not the place to work out your wounding and brokenness. It's really not. Right? Spurgeon knew that it was very easy for us to use church leadership not to serve and honor God, but to win influence and honor for ourselves. Can I ask you something? Can you do me a favor? I I'm asking you. Please, I'm pleading with you. Do not covet this position. Anyone who comes up here on stage on Sundays to serve you, I can assure you, they are not celebrities. You know what they are? They're lead servants. They have a target on their backs. We're on uh, the King of Darkness's most wanted list. They don't enjoy the same freedoms as you. 
The Bible says that they will be judged more harshly than you. Their successes and their failures are more visible in public. And so they endure more scrutiny than you. Trust me when I say this. Put yourself in this position without God doing it, and you do it at your own peril. Now, don't look at me with that tone of voice. All right, this, is not, this is not a rant. This is not a rant. All the conversations that are, that are happening in Christendom right now, uh, mo- a lot of the conversations that are happening in Christendom right now, they surround um, uh, fallen pastors and abusive organizations and ministries and church hurt and church wounds. Do you, do you know why it is? Because leaders are getting elevated who are not called to be here. Um, I, uh, a couple years into youth pastoring, there was a, a gentleman that went to my church that uh, was gifted. He was, he was great. Uh, but I was hanging out with him one night, and he was just frustrated about what, where he was on his path. And he said to me, that I'm called to be the youth. I was a youth pastor of the church. He said, I'm called to be the youth pastor of this church, but you're in my way. Amy, tell me when I start lying. I'm called to be the youth pastor of this church, but you're in my way. And let me just say, God spoke for me in that moment. I, I'm not sure that I was mature enough or secure enough to respond the way I actually did because. I didn't even get upset. I just put my arm around him and I said, you know what, brother? If that's the case, the beauty of, of, of that is that if God called you to be youth pastor of this church, nothing's going to stop you from being youth pastor of this church. See, be very careful. <laughs> be very careful before you start to think that a particular person is keeping you from positions of influence. It very well could be the merciful intervention of God. It could be. Here's a great way to think of it. Uh, Tom Nelson wrote a book called The Flourishing Pastor, and he gave this example, uh, and I've never forgotten it. And this is what he says. He says, if you ever see a turtle on a fence post, don't waste your time wondering how it climbed up there. You ever see this? Don't look at the pole and say, man, that brother's talented. Don't waste your time. Most assuredly, someone put it up there. Okay. Right? This needs to be the posture of every, of every pastoral leader. However low or high, your pastoral ministry fence post. Make sure that you are not trying to crawl to the visible top on your own. Because if God wants you there, let God unmistakably put you there. Thanks, Terry. You're so good at rallying people. I love you. Uh, Francis Chan, I'm going to punch you there. Uh, Francis Chan uh, spent a few years uh, in Hong Kong, serving in Hong Kong, uh, and he served with some underground church leaders in China. Uh, and he had a conversation with one of those leaders, and this is what that leader said to Francis Chan. It's crazy. He said, You Americans keep thinking you have to become popular to have an impact. But in China, those who are the most hidden have the greatest impact. See, the reason why is they couldn't be visible. They would get shut down or arrested or or worse. They couldn't. And this is what Francis said uh, in response to that. He said, could it be possible that being quieter and being in the presence of God and doing more things that are unseen will actually have a greater impact in lifting up the name of Jesus and making hallowed his name. I don't know who needs to hear this. 
But for some of us in this room, the greatest gift that God can give you for your giftedness is hiddenness. It's the greatest thing for you. Thank you, baby. I see you. The babies will amen me if you don't. And see, the reason why we can embrace obscurity and hiddenness and wait for God to elevate us is because Jesus did it first. Jesus is the greater Jotham. Jotham means God is blameless. Right? Jesus is the hidden son. The one that God kept in secret until Paul in, in Galatians 4 says, until the right time. And when Jesus did come, you know what he said? He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he has anointed me to preach the good news. To his disciples, he said, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them, they will bear much fruit. And his great character was revealed in his willingness to take the curse upon himself. See, Jesus took the curse upon himself so he could exchange for us all the blessings, all the blessings of heaven. Jesus took on the curse for himself. He was crowned with thorns, as it were. The fate of the thorn bush became his so he could present us holy and blameless to his Father. I just want to switch gears here for a moment because um, it's really important to note that Israel was not fighting a foreign enemy. So as we've been going through the book of Judges, what we've seen, every time Israel was in trouble, it was because they were being conquered or oppressed by a foreign enemy. But in Judges chapter 9, that's not what was happening. They were fighting each other. And unfortunately, Judges chapter 9 is the bad fruit of seed sown by Gideon in Judges chapter 8. And so I just want to talk for a moment about finishing well. Because instead of pouring his life into serving God and setting up Israel to enjoy generations of peace and the worship of Yahweh, Gideon spends the balance of his day. Think about this way. We all know Gideon's story because we know that Gideon led a small army into war against the Midianites, completely outnumbered, and won that battle. Gideon was then on the other side of that. He would spend the balance of his days uh, 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 on the other side of the miraculous victory, living like a king without the responsibilities of kingship. Gideon used God to establish and bolster his own position instead of using his position to serve and to be used by God. He retired. He did not finish well. But I don't believe that is the heart posture of the saints in this church. I don't believe that. So at this time, I'm going to ask a beloved spiritual father to come up here uh, and just give us a, a few words. Um, Eric, Eric is coming up. Um, Eric's heart is for the next generation. Um, Eric is a spiritual father to many men and women of God in this region that are absolutely giving the devil hell. Oh. Heaven. Thanks, thanks, Bob. And so, I just want him to share. I know this is a, an issue in particular that like weighs on him heavily. So he's going to share a few words. You guys, let me give you my give him a hand, huh? I I just wanted to be known at the beginning. I have a lot of spiritual daughters, and they are the type who their middle name would be JL. And they know how to drop millstones. So that's kind of the kind of guy I am. Uh, I also don't want confusion. Sometimes when the anointing hits me, um, I yell. And so if that bothers you, that's probably religion. So that'll help you with that too. 
it bothered me a whole lot when it started happening, and I had to get over myself. I'd also like for my spiritual sons and daughters to stand up. <clears throat> These are my pride and joy. Thank you, guys. Um, I actually am a person who has known a lot of brokenness um, and who's made choices like many of, of us in our 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, I'm 67, and when you get to this age, you start really thinking about your life differently. And you're thinking about a legacy, and hopefully. But for many of us, we actually are so aware of the choices that we've made that we have, uh, I have actually spiritual sons and daughters who no longer walk for the Lord. Uh, I have some of them that have uh, created great payoffs. And so I can look at myself and live in that regret and that pain. I've made financial decisions that were uh, life impacting. I've actually made some moral choices that I completely regret. The reason I share that so openly is because we have to, our generation, like the younger generation intimidates us because they're so, I work with them all the time and I can walk in. If I have on the wrong shirt, God forbid I wear the wrong kind of shoes uh, or that I have a t-shirt that's not cool. It was three months ago, but it's not going to work today. And so I understand that the younger generations, they scare us. Because they're all talking about uh, their childhood trauma, their triggers, their emotions, and we're like, but are you paying your bills? That's our generation. So I, oh, I'm so sorry for you. And we, uh, we struggle to feel confident when we face the younger generation. I love the younger generation because they're very honest. And so they call me on all my BS. Uh, if I don't walk my talk, they point that out. Uh, they let me know. They let me know if I have on something that's not cool. Um, but our generation, we are, we have much to offer. We have much to offer. However, I think sometimes the things that I just mentioned, the reason I share those so openly, one is because it's our testimony, Revelation 12, 10, 11. If you have a testimony in your past or you have things in your past and you cannot talk about them, you need to get free because it's your testimony that it overcomes the enemy. It's not your, it's not your academic scholarship in the Word. Uh, we, can, we can know a whole lot of verses and have no authority in the spirit realm. Because to the level that I have shame about my testimony, to that level I cannot speak. And so um, I just want to share with you a little bit um, about Moses. Before I do that, um, in 2019, one of my daughters came to me and she said, you need to get your act together. She said, your inner circle is leaving you. In my inner circle was the owner of a multi-million dollar company. He was a uh, son of mine. Uh, I started with him when he was the company. There's another one of my guys who is working on a $40 million video game. We used to live together 24 years ago. And then he married and, and uh, moved on. There's another son who literally goes all over the world preaching. Very powerful. There's a woman in there who, when she prays, she loses the hounds of heaven. You need to be afraid if she loses the hounds of heaven uh, on something that's coming after you because it will fall. But she said, you need to get your act together because your inner circle is exploding and you're going to be left behind. And the thought came to me, all you're doing, you're not building a platform. There's going to be nothing left. All you have is spiritual sons and daughters. Is this all you're going to do? And I had spiritual sons and daughters at that time who I had been with a decade. Many of them had one or two or three children. And I really wrestle with that because what looks like success in the Christian world is your merch, your books, and, you know, your platform. And I, I had to spend time with the Lord on it. And I came to the – because when you spiritually father, you're actually still changing diapers, sometimes long past the age you think you should be. Uh, they will break your heart. The choice is you're like, if I can get through the first five years – 
they're going to mature, and then they're going to get married, and they do, and all the family of origin issues, and in our culture today, all the sexual issues come to the surface when they marry, and then you're like, but I thought this was going to get easier. I told my sister, who's one of my main intercessors, it just gets harder, but it's, it was very powerful, the Lord, I really sat and thought about this and pondered my kids, and I looked at the things that I could do to build a platform for what's up for us. And I determined that the greatest legacy that I can leave, and the guy who, who leads the, who has the $40 million video game, he told me, he said, heaven looks at things differently, Eric. He said, You're, you have the father heart of God. You're in the trenches. I'm going to build a video game, and I believe this video game will have international it's, it's a Christian video game. It will have international uh, impact. But he said, do what you're doing. And so I want to speak to many of you. I want to share uh, from Deuteronomy 34. It says, Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah. It faces Jericho, and the Lord showed him all the land. Gilead, as far as Dan, all of Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev, and the plain in the valley of Jericho, the city of Palms as far as Zoar. The Lord then said to him, This is the land I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to your descendants. I have let it, you see it with your own eyes, but you will not cross into it. And I was like, This is Moses. I don't know if you guys know the Old Testament, but those Israelites. I would have just asked God to open up the ground and take all of them. Because they were a horrid bunch of people. That's not how Moses looked at it. It said, Moses, he could have stood there and said, why can't I cross into this promised land? It said, Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there. And God buried him in the land of Moab, facing Beth Peor. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not weak, and his vitality had not left him. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab. Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moab, because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites obeyed him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. They obeyed Joshua, but they did as the Lord had commanded Moses. No prophet, this is how God wrote his epitaph. No prophet has arisen again in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unparalleled for all the signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do against the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh, all his officials, and to his land, and for all the mighty acts of power and terrifying deeds that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. God didn't, he didn't, uh, Moses only struck a rock twice. That was his great sin. But he misrepresented the Lord in that moment. I thought it was so powerful that as Moses died, it says his vitality had not left him. Our gen my generation, many of us are doing a quiet quit. That's what they call it in the business world. I've heard a lot of talk about Gen Z because they just left the church. A lot of us attend the church, but we have left the place of authority that we are to stand in. in these last days. There is a move of God, I do believe, that is coming. And there will be a lot of younger generation that come to the Lord. But it's going to be the gray hairs and the white hairs that need to stand and fight for what's coming. And so today, I want to call you out of the place. Many of you have memories just like I do of things that you wish had gone differently, choices you could have made that would have literally changed your life. Some of us, I, I am one of those people, there are some promised lands I will not go into because of choices I have made. Mm -hmm. But the reputation that I want, that I'm going after, and the beautiful thing is any of us can have this. It says, no prophet had arisen again in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord new face to face. So I want to encourage you, if you're here, can we go ahead and ask them to stand? Yeah.
if you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s, if you could stand up. Be careful, Bob. <laughs> we, we can still know the Lord face to face. And as people of God, we want to do mighty acts of power. I want to do terrifying deeds like Moses performed. I told the enemy once, years ago, I told him, for every scar that you placed on my soul, I will raise up a son or daughter who's going to give you heaven on earth. There was a time when I hated the enemy more than I loved God because I couldn't imagine how God could love me with some of the choices that I had made. I'm not at that place anymore. I love God with all my heart to the best of my ability, and some days it really sucks. I'm face to face with Him. But I just want to pray over you, um, and I'm going to address neural paths. Just, just, just hang with me. It might sound a little weird. I actually, I want to do before he prays. I actually want you to come forward. You're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, or above. I want you to come forward. I'm going to pray over you, coming from a humble place. It's a frightening thing to take this microphone. could just come on in, come around the front, and go over to the side. We could go this way a little bit so everybody can get around the front. I just, first of all, I want to thank you for all the choices that you've made, all of you, the quiet choices that no one knows about, the things that you have chosen to survive. Some of the horrible memories, some of the things you've struggled through in your marriages, some of you still struggle incredibly in your marriages. Some of you are standing here today and you, your hearts are so broken over some of the choices that your children have made. Maybe even if they've come back to the Lord, there's still consequences. Some of us can look back at our lives and realize if I had done that differently, some of my children would have been in a different place, possibly. So I'm going to address some of that and pray in healing over you. Right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that came in the flesh, I break the power of all memories that the enemy taunts you with, harasses you with, condemns you with. I break the power of every accusation that comes against your mind. I break the power of emotion that feels like a permanent stronghold. I break the power of every videotape. Any secret thing you ever did in, in private that you are ashamed with, that, that the enemy tries to make you think is keeping you from having authority. Right now, I cut and sever that in the spirit realm. I speak to your neural path, which is how your mind works. And I pray healing over the broken neural path. I break the power of every lie, word, curse, and accusation, particularly any of those spoken by family members and specifically by your children. I break the power of all of that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth that came in the flesh. Yeah. I speak honor over you. You may have had what you consider to be a quiet life. You may think that nothing that you did really has had that much significance. The fact that you stand here today when so many have quiet quit and no longer come, that you had the courage to come to the front, I celebrate you and everything that you've done to stand where you stand today. I speak life over you and purpose that God would give you such an incredible sense of who you are, the little boy, because we're all older, but the little boy and the little girl that is inside of you. I speak healing over the little boy, the little girl that still needs to know the affirmation of a father. 
I just speak the blessing of Father God. And as a, a father in the kingdom, I pray a father's blessing over you. You may never have had this. But in the spirit realm, I literally ask Father God to touch you with the blessing of a father. I bless you for everything that you've done to step towards him. I bless your future. We do not live in the past. God has a future for every single one of us. I call your spirit fully forward. I ask God to heal all the fragments of your heart in and, and this one dimension, to bring it all into one dimension. That you would feel the healing bomb of Gilead over your spirit. And I celebrate destiny over you. Not only in this church, but as you go out in the, in the world. That we would carry the sense of our Father. And that we would literally break agreement. I encourage you, whatever the enemy is, has, because he has something in all of us. Whatever it is that has kept you stuck, has kept you defined by something other than God's Word, your identity is not the mistakes nor the choices you've made in the past. It's not even your good choices you make now. Our identity is set by Jesus Christ. Come on. The Word says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no truth. People talk about their truth. You don't have a truth separate from the truth of who you are as a son or a daughter of God. Come on. So I just bless you today. I pray strength into your bones, into your DNA. That you would have the courage to believe that God actually created your DNA for a purpose. And that you would have the ability to hear God past every, all the interference from the past, memories, videos. I break the power of pictures. I, I just break the power of everything that comes against your mind. And I speak to your neural past healing. I pray all these things today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the man who came in the flesh. If you guys can stay up here. Can I have the 20 and 30-year-olds who are in the room come down? I want you to stand behind. And just put the hand on the shoulder of somebody who's up here. Yeah. And some of you can come around here. There's some of us, some of our brothers and sisters up front. Got some more over here. <laughs> so, from the younger generation, we just say that we need you. We need you. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I break off of you all dishonor that was put on you by the younger generation. We break off of you dishonor that was sown by even younger people in your workplace. Some of you who are up here right now weren't given things that you were set up for in your workplace and they were given to somebody else just because they were younger. We break off the trauma of that memory in Jesus' name. Father, I, I just even break off um, this idea. We, we as a younger generation declare you are not the obstacle to us becoming who we're supposed to be in God. You are not the obstacles in the way of us becoming who we're supposed to be in the kingdom. We need you to go with us, not to just stand behind and tell us where to go next. We need you to come with us. So, Father, right now, in the name and authority of Jesus, I'm even asking right now that as a prophetic sign of what you're doing in this generation, that prodigals would begin to come home that sons and daughters who they have not had conversations with in months and some of them years would begin to call, that there would be restoration in families, Lord. In Jesus' name, God, we thank you that there is synergy that happens in the body of Christ. It's not one generation's anointing versus another. It's all Christ's anointing coming together through a body. So, Father, we thank you that in the Rock of Roseville, we are declaring that you are going to turn us into a body who knows how to do generational 
well. So, Father, we bless, as the younger generation, we bless, we bless, we bless the gifts and callings on this generation. And we just, um, I even speak to hearts here where you sidelined yourself. Nobody told you that you had to step aside. Nobody told you that you were supposed to walk away. God didn't ask you to walk away, but you took yourself out of the game. In the name and authority of Jesus, I speak to the gifts inside of you that have lain dormant, and I call them forward by the power and the fire of the Holy Spirit, that they would come back, that dreams would be restored, that gifts would come back to the forefront in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for releasing life over this older generation in our house, God. Life, life, life in Jesus' name. that the society grows great when the old men plant trees under whom they know they'll never sit. Or to say it another way, those who plant trees are not interested in shade for themselves. We have a heart for generations. Psalm 145 says, One uh, generation shall declare the, the, the mighty act of God. They right? took to another. That's you guys. Right. Um, I'm a sports guy, so I gotta do this. So, in, in, in 1998, Michael Jordan retired from the NBA. And when he retired, he was the best player in the league. And so he retired, and upon retirement, he immediately took a position as the president of basketball operations for the Washington Wizards. And he also took on a 10% ownership stake of the team. So he watched for a few years, but then he just got this itch to get back into the game. And so he did it. And let me just tell you guys, when he went back into the NBA and threw a Wizards jersey on, uh, he, was not a, he wasn't the best player in the league anymore. He was a little clunky. He couldn't play the amount of minutes. It was humbling. It cost him something to go back out there. But what... He gave to those guys by being on the court was invaluable. Most people also don't know this is that you can't be a player and an owner, and so he gave up somewhere around thirty million dollars to get back on the court. And I say all this to say this: it's going to cost you something to stay unretired in the kingdom of God. It's going to cost something. But if we're ever going to see revival in our day, I believe this strongly. We are going to need our living legends, our MVPs, to throw Wizards jerseys on and stay in the game. See, our culture panders to us as we get older and, and tries to get us into this consumer mindset that life is about cruises and relaxation and rest, potluck lunches and social gatherings and bus trips. Dude, that's, we're not doing that. We're really not. No, we're going to do those, but we'll do other things. Okay? We're also going to serve God. Amen. So listen, we need you. Finish well. We cannot be what we don't do. Father, I just bless this beautiful, amazing group of people in front of us. How oh God, we need them. Thank you for the investment of their time and their energy and their hearts, their knowledge, their commitment. They have never been more equipped to be spiritual moms and dads. I don't know why you give us kids in our 20s. Because never are we more ready for it than in this season. And so God, right now, I just release them to do exactly what you call them to do, which is to spend the balance of their days 
serving you in whatever way you call them to, God. That they will wear wizard's jerseys and they will stay in the game. They will not be fans. All fans do is they just sit around and they cheer and boo based on the performance of those in the game. That will not be them. And so we bless them right now.